All right, good morning, everybody who's here. Uh, so we're talking about uh, implementing a stack using a linked sequence of nodes um, in the previous couple of lectures. Um, the node class is a bit unusual. Uh, so it's the one class that we've seen where you have a field in the class node that is also a reference to a node. Right? So every node has a reference to one node. Uh, and that's a bit funny. Um, so the node class is an example of what's called uh, recursion of structure or structural recursion. Right? Every node has a reference to a node. Right? But that, there's a problem there, right? Because every node, because that node that has reference to also has a reference to another node, which has a reference to another node and so on and so on and so on. Right? So just like in, I guess, programmatic recursion, um, you need some base case somewhere to stop the recursion, right? And so for our node class, eventually uh, you come to a node whose reference is null. Right? Uh, at least that's how, uh, that's how, so for a linear structure, that's what you do. Uh, I guess I should show you a picture of something else though. So it is possible uh, for you to have uh, a node, so N1, so it has a reference to another node. So we'll call that N2. Uh, how am I drawing these? I'm drawing these with an arrow, right? Right? Which has a reference to another node, N3. Which then has a reference to the original node, like that. Okay. And so there's an example of a structure that is infinitely recursive, right? It never ends. Um, it just keeps on going around in a circle. Uh, so that's an example of what's called a circular linked list or some sort of circular uh, structure. Right. It has some use um, in uh, data structures. Question? Next? No, no, no. Uh, every node. Uh, so class node. Uh, so remember, we're, we use nodes to store data, right? So every node has an element of some kind. So uh, for our uh, stack of strings, every node has a string. And we call that an element, right? You can call it whatever you want, right? Data, S, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the node also has a reference to, its, uh, to the next node in the sequence, right? So remember, next is the link to the next node in the sequence. Right. All right, so assuming we work with linear structures where there's the last node in the sequence. Has a next link that is null. Uh, you can then easily write recursive methods uh, involving nodes. I guess there's something else I should point out too. Oh, here we go. Um, so in this picture here, you can think of C as being the, the node at the top of a sequence of three nodes, right? So the C is the topmost node. But if you ignore C and you look at B, right? You can think of B as being the top node in a stack of size two, right? And if you look at just the A, ignoring the C and the B, you can think of the A as being the top node uh, in a stack of size one, right? So again, we see the recursive structure of nodes, right? Every node is the top of some stack, right? As you go deeper into the stack, the top, the node, the stack that it is the top of gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Okay, so here's two string uh, implemented recursively, or this is one way that you could implement two string. So the uh, overridden version of two string is up here. Um, and instead of using a loop to iterate over the sequence of nodes, it's going to call a recursive helper method to recursively iterate over the sequence of nodes. Right. So we start out with a string builder or a string, right? String builder is just a mutable version of string. So we start out with a string builder and we start at the top node uh, and we simply recursively call this method, we call two string helper and two string helper is the recursive version of two, uh, is the recursive method that will build the string representation of the stack. So we pass in the starting node. So in this case, we want to start at the top. Right? And when you go and look at two string helper, right, 
it has a base case. So if you pass in a null node, that means you've gotten to the end of the sequence. So there's nothing left to produce for this string, so we can simply return the empty string. It's not the null node, then that means we're somewhere in the middle of the stack. So we're gonna look at the node and get its element, right there. Right. If, you, if that bothers you, you can write nelem.toString. So when you write something like string plus some reference type here, right, uh, the Java automatically calls toString on your reference type here. Right. Uh, so I'm just gonna change that in the slide. So that is the same thing as writing dot toString. Right, they both mean the same thing in this case. Oh, hang on. Uh, I need one of these and then I can do this. Okay. All right. So perhaps slightly more clearly, right? So if we, if n is not a null node, that means it has an element. So we grab the string representation of its element, right? And then I need to produce the string representation of the rest of the stack. Right, so remember the next node is the rest of this, is the next node is the node that starts the rest of the stack. So I can generate its string representation by calling two string helper, passing in the next node in the sequence. Right. And so there's a small example of how you could recursively generate, uh, you can, uh, writing a recursive method on one of these linked sequences. I think it's fair to say that most people don't think recursively. So for these linear structures, most programmers would probably just write a regular for loop. Um, if you're one of the rare people who do like to think, who does like to think recursively, uh, then you might consider writing many of your algorithms on these linear structures recursively. All right, uh, so that's all that I want to say about uh, linked stacks implemented with a linked sequence of nodes for the time being. Uh, before we move on, does anybody have any questions about uh, working with these linked structures? All right, so the next assignment did show up last night. Um, the first part of the assignment is three short programming questions. Uh, they all involve working on um, linked stacks. So it, it forces you, well, it's trying to force you uh, to work with one of these linked structures. Um, so there's a little bit of manipulating nodes and iterating over sequence of nodes. But the programming questions are quite short. Uh, part two looks quite long, but it actually walks you through the entire, almost the entire solution uh, for part two of the assignment. Um, and part two of the assignment uh, deals with inheritance, uh, which is what I'm about to start right now. Okay, so the next major topic in the course is inheritance. Uh, and so it's the last relationship uh, between classes uh, that we're interested in talking about in this course. Uh, so inheritance is a relationship between two classes where one class is derived from another class. Uh, so uh, there's a quote here from the Java tutorial, and it, uh, so I'll just quickly read it out. Uh, the idea of inheritance is simple but powerful when you want to create a new class, and there's already a class that includes some of the code that you want. Uh, you can derive your new class from the existing class, right? And doing this, you can reuse the fields and methods of the existing class without having to write and debug them yourself. Right? And so that last part there is the important part, right? So when you use inheritance, you create a new class, Right. That new class is an extension of an existing class. Right. So, nor and so far in this course, when we've created a class, we've put in some fields, we put in some constructors, we put in some methods. When you use inheritance, and if you can reuse the fields of an existing class, right, you don't put those fields into the new class that you create. Right. Similarly, if there's methods that you can use from the existing class without having to change how they work, you don't put the methods in the new class either, right? And so this is a mechanism, you can think of this as a mechanism for code reuse, um, right? The fields and methods of some other class can be reused um, in one of its, uh, what we call a subclass. Um, hierarchy, uh, this is Java's mechanism, one of Java's mechanisms for implementing what's called hierarchy in the object model, right? So inheritance and uh, interfaces um, are both mechanisms for hierarchies of classes in Java. Right. And so, what's a hierarchy? Well, a hierarchy is something that looks like this, right? There's something at the top, and there's something underneath it, there's something underneath those, and so on, and so on, and so forth, right? Uh, so the hierarchy in, the class hierarchy in Java, at the top is this class called big O object. So every class in Java, 
is a subclass of this thing here. Right? So string is a subclass of object. Every class that you've created in this course is a subclass of object. So a subclass or derived class or extended class or child class, there is no standard um, jargon for describing these things. Um, depending on when you learned object-oriented programming and which language you used to learn it, they all have a different uh, naming uh, for these things. Uh, I'm gonna try to use subclass and superclass all the time. So a subclass is simply a class that's derived from another class. Right? So here's object. Remember, object is at the top of Java's hierarchy of classes. String is derived from uh, object. So we say that string is a subclass of object. Uh, we also say that object is the superclass of string. Right? If you're talking about only two classes, uh, then you might use the term child class for string and parent for object. Right? Um, but that sort of breaks down when you have lots and lots of classes uh, in arranging their hierarchy. Right, so superclass, subclass. Yes? This is a, this is a UML picture of an inheritance uh, relationship. Uh, aggregation doesn't use uh, the uh, arrow, right? Aggregation use a open diamond, right? Change it to a closed diamond composition. No diamond association, right? And then if you change the shape of the lines and the connectors, they all mean other relationships too, right? So on the assignment, you're going to see a picture of uh, a UML diagram that shows you what uh, implementing an interface looks like. Um, it's not super important for, uh, for the purposes of this course. Okay, so, uh, the hierarchy of classes can be arbitrarily deep in Java. So starting from object, because remember everything starts from object, you can have a subclass of object called X. Right? X can have a subclass called Z, Z can have a subclass called A, A could have a subclass called something else, that class could have a subclass called something else, and so on and so on and so on. Right? It can keep on going um, uh, theoretically for, well no, so I guess there's no built in upper limit to how deep the hierarchy can go. So classes can be derived from a class that is derived from a class and so on. Eventually though, you always get back to object. Right? So object's always at the top of the inheritance hierarchy in Java. Uh, so we say that a class is descended from all of the classes in the inheritance chain going back to object. A is descended from Z, A is descended from X, A is descended from object. Right? Z is descended from X, Z is descended from object, and so on and so on and so forth. So the classes above a class are called the ancestors, right? So Z, X, and object are the ancestors of A, right? X and object are the ancestors of Z. Uh, X only has one ancestor, uh, object. Right? Now it's also the case that, uh, or at least for most people, uh, that instead of ancestor, you can use superclass. So A has the superclasses Z, X, and object, right? Similarly, the other way around, object has the subclasses X, Z, and A, right? Um, if you, uh, if sometimes you really only want to talk about the immediate superclass, so the immediate superclass of Z is X, uh, and the immediate subclass of X is Z, right? Sometimes that relationship is important. Um, in those cases, I will try to remember to explicitly say the immediate superclass or the immediate subclass. Okay, so why do we want to use inheritance? Um, so, um, when you use inheritance, the subclass inherits everything that's not private in the superclass except for the constructors. Uh, so in Java, constructors are never inherited, right? If you need a constructor in a subclass, you have to write the constructor, right? There's no way to recycle, um, there's no way to uh, automatically get a constructor from the superclass in Java, right? But everything that's not private 
uh, gets inherited. Uh, yeah, everything that's not private. So anything that's protected or anything that's public in a class is inherited by its subclasses. Yes? Yeah. So, hang on, let me, I think I need to draw a picture for you. Okay, so you're talking about the class random. And so random is a class, which means it inherits from or it's a subclass of object, right? Um, random defines its own constructors, right? So inside random, there is a constructor, public constructor, like that. Right? So it has its own constructor. So, right? It has to have its own constructors. It doesn't get any from objects. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I understand. Okay, so now we subclass random. So uh, in these UM programs, they don't have to be drawn from top down. So you can, uh, you can do this. It gets confusing if you do this, but you can let me do this. Okay, so you subclass random for some reason, so I'm gonna call it my random. Right? Your class has to provide a constructor. It doesn't get any from here, right? So it has to define a my random constructor. Now, if it doesn't, right, if it doesn't define its own constructor, or if random doesn't define its own constructor, the rule in Java is, is that Java's gonna make one for you, right? So we talked about that a long time ago, right? Um, so if you don't write this construct, or if you don't write constructors, make one up for you. It has to have one, right? That the purpose of the constructor is to initialize uh, the state of a newly created object, right? It's responsible for part of the process of birthing an object. So yes, that's what I'm saying, it has to have its own. Although what you're asking, we will have to talk about that later. Okay, all right, so, subclass inherits everything that's not private, right? So not private means not private and not package private. Um, so anything that's protected, anything that's public, it inherits. So if there's some class that provides some functionality that you need, right, you don't have to rewrite all of that functionality. Right? You simply, you can consider simply deriving a new class from the existing class. Right? So Java uses the word derive uh, or extends. Um, the keyword is extends to indicate inheritance. Right? Your new class that you create has direct access to everything that's public and protected, right? Except, uh, yes, that direct access to everything that, that's public and protected, right? Um, without having to redeclare or re-implement them. Right? Now, if you want to, so typically when you do this, uh, there's a class that you want uh, that does something that you uh, need, but you want to add extra functionality to that class, right? And so you can do that, right? You can add new fields to your newly created class. Right. When you add the new fields, don't duplicate the ones that you inherited. That's almost always a mistake. Right. You can add brand new methods to your class. Because right. you're just making another class. So you can add anything new to your class that you like. Right. Now, if you want to, so if the class that you inherited from has a method that doesn't quite do what you want it to do, right, you can redefine or override how that superclass method works, right? And that's what we've been doing throughout the course, right? Usually, what, so all of our classes inherit from objects. We don't have a choice in that, right? Uh, we've often decided to specialize how toString or equals or hash code works, right? We override the inherited version of those methods to provide the functionality that we need for our class, right? Similarly, we've been adding new fields to our classes because object doesn't have any fields that we're aware of, so we have to add our own fields, right? And we've been adding our own methods. Again, because object doesn't really have many methods in it that are useful in general. Sorry, that are useful in uh, specific, in particular, for the classes that we've been implementing. 
Okay, so what exactly does, in, what exactly is, is inheritance supposed to model? Remember, it is a relationship between two classes. So, inheritance is supposed to model the is a relationship between classes. Okay. So, is a means that a subclass is substitutable for any of its ancestor classes, right? So, that is the long winded um, but more correct um, explanation of what uh, inheritance means or is supposed to mean. Uh, so it means if, if you have a method that requires a subclass, uh, sorry, if you have a method that requires some kind of object, you're supposed to be able to call that method by passing in any subclass of the object that you require, of the type that you require. So everything then in Java is substitutable for objects. Right? So if you have a string, right, you can pass that string to a method that takes in a big O object and the method should if everybody's done their work correctly, uh, work the way um, the method says it's, uh, it will, right? So is substitutable for means, right? Your string can do anything that a big O object can do. Right? So what methods does big O object have? Well, we know it has equals hash code and two string, right? What does that mean? It means a string also has hash code equals and two string. Right? Any one of the classes that we created also has hash code equals n2 string. Right? Any of the classes that we made in the course can do everything that big O object can do. Right? So Java is um, an example of a language that uses what's called single inheritance. Did I put that down? Oh, here it is, it's in the next slide. Right? And so what that means is that uh, this thing, ob uh, sorry, that, sorry I'm, that's not what I mean at all. Okay, sorry. Ignore what I just said. All right, so in Java, the class object is unique. So it's the only class that has no superclass, right? It sits at the top of the inheritance hierarchy. Every class in Java is descended from object, right? Or every class in Java is a subclass of object. So when you make a new class and you don't actually say what its superclass is in Java, then the, uh, the compiler assumes you mean the superclass is actually Java lang object. So even though, we, so we've made lots of classes in the course, right, we've never mentioned object at all um, when we declare the class, and that's because the compiler is doing that for us. All right, so if you have a superclass in Java, it can have as many subclasses um, as you want. Right? So here X is some class, it has three subclasses, uh, Y, Z, and W. So in Java, a subclass uh, has exactly one superclass. Right? So a superclass, as many subclasses as you want, right? but for any given subclass, it has exactly one direct, there should be the word direct in here, it has exactly one direct superclass. Right? And so in Java, this is called, uh, in general, this is called single inheritance. Right? A class can only directly descend from one other class. Uh, so the reason that the, uh, the designers of the Java language decided to do this is uh, that um, it, it avoids a problem that occurs if you allow a class to inherit from, to directly uh, descend from more than one class. So here's Z, right? So this is not Java, this is in some other language. So here's Z, Z has two direct superclasses, right? It inherits directly from Y, it inherits directly from W, right? Now, y and W, they both have one superclass, X, right? So remember what inheritance means? Inheritance means if you have a uh, non-private method, uh, all of the subclasses inherit that non-private method. So here's X. Suppose X defines some public method F, right? What does that mean? It means Y also inherits F, right? W also inherits F. What are the subclasses allowed to do with their inherited methods? Well, they can change how they work, right? So Y can override the definition of F and W is allowed to override its definition of F, right? So X has its own version of F, Y and W now have their own versions of F. Z inherits F from both Y and W, 
And so now the problem is, is what version of f does z inherit? Right, does it get y's, does it get w's, does it get x's, does it have to redefine it into so that it has its own? Who knows, right? So the languages that allow this sort of thing to happen um, support what is called multi-inheritance, right? A class can inherit, from, uh, can inherit directly from more than one class, right? They, all those types of languages have to deal with this particular problem. Right. Uh, the name of the problem is called the deadly diamond of death. Um, if you uh, Google that term, you will in fact find a Wikipedia page uh, that describes this exact problem. Right. Uh, so the, the Java designers decided they didn't want to deal with this problem. This problem goes away if you uh, only allow single inheritance. Um, and so Java is a single inheritance language. Uh, if you continue in computing science and you take the third year software engineering course, uh, you'll eventually learn C++. Uh, C++ is a multi-inheritance language. Okay, so from a Java point of view, uh, inheritance means is a or is substitutable for, right? And so what that means uh, is that you can use a subclass instance anywhere you need a superclass instance, right? So we, we have some method that takes in a big O object. So here's some method, right? It requires that the caller pass in a reference to a big O object, object, right? Inside the method, right? Uh, any, any method that big O object has, you can call using little obj, right? So to string equals hash code and a few other methods, right? So how can you call this method? Well, I can make a string, s, Right? I can use that string to call some method, right? Why does this work? Because string is an object, right? Or string is substitutable for object, right? I can make a hash set or a linked list or a array list, whatever you want, right? And you can pass it to some method. Why? Because hash set is an object, right? We can make a point to object, pass it to the method, right? That works, point is a, is an object, right, or is substitutable for object. All right, you have to be careful about this term is a, right? So you have to remember that this is a programming language, it's not the real world. So is a has nothing to do with the real world, right? It has everything to do with how you are modeling the problem you're trying to solve. Right? So the classic example here uh, it comes from mathematics, right? Um, it's the is a circle an ellipse or not, right? Um, so mathematically, a circle is an ellipse, right? Cir an ellipse is just a circle that's stretched out in um, some direction, right? And so the question is, if you're going to implement these classes in Java, right, can you do something like this, right? So can I make a class called ellipse, right, and have circle inherit from ellipse? You can also substitute square and rectangle in here, right? Is a square a rectangle, right? Well, mathematically, a square is a rectangle where the sides happen to all have the same length, right? Okay, so mathematically, a circle is a kind of ellipse, right? But remember what uh, inheritance means in Java, right? It means everything that a, an ellipse can do, right? A circle must also be able to do the same thing because circle is supposed to be substitutable for ellipse. Right. So if your ellipse class has some method in it or has some class invariant in it that a circle can't support, then uh, this relationship breaks down. Right. So remember, isa means you can substitute a derived class instance for one of its ancestor instances, right? So I can derive Assuming this relationship is valid, right, I can pass in a circle wherever I need an ellipse. Right? So if a circle can't do something that an ellipse can do, then you can't su safely substitute circle for ellipse. So for example, right, you make your ellipse class, right, so this is a class that represents two-dimensional shapes, right, and you decide that you, put in a uh, you want a method called set size, so I can change the size of the ellipse. Right? Obviously you're not, you don't want to allow a width or height to be uh, zero or negative. Well, you might allow zero, but definitely not negative. 
So an ellipse has a width and it has a height. So you can independently change both the width and the height of an ellipse. Right? How would you implement it? Well, it's pretty easy, right? You just set the width to width and you set the height to height. Right? And away you go. Remember now, if you, uh, if you have circle inherit from ellipse, circle inherits this method. Right? Oh, hang on. Boop, boop, boop. Right? So if circle inherits this method and you pass it a circle, right? You now change the width of the circle to, say, one, and you change the height of the circle to, say, two, and you no longer have a circle. Right? You've now got an ellipse. Right? And so this doesn't work in Java. Right? Um, your circle, it doesn't make sense to have a circle that has a height not equal to its width. Right? However, it inherits this set size method. Um, uh, so you're trying to, uh, so now you're in a situation where circle can't do something uh, that an ellipse can do. So if set size promises to change the width and height of the shape to the specified width and height, you're kind of stuck, right? When you do that for a circle, there's no guarantee that the resulting shape is still a circle. Right? We'll come back to this problem uh, in a little bit more detail later on this week, uh, next week. Okay, so what happens if there is no set size method? So if you're, the ellipse class doesn't actually let you change the size of the ellipse, right? then it might be the case that you can, in fact, have circle inherit from ellipse, right? You have to check, right? Can a circle actually do everything an ellipse can do? If the answer is yes, then you can use that inheritance relationship if you want to. If the answer is no, then you're not supposed to use that inheritance relationship. The problem in Java is, is there's nothing stopping you from doing this anyway, right? So even if this relationship doesn't make sense, in Java, you can still go ahead and do it, right? It might seem to work, depending on the problem you're trying to solve, right? Until it doesn't, right? So for example, if no one ever calls set size, then no one ever realizes that there's a problem, right? So if the user of your circle class, of the, sorry, if the creator of the circle class never calls set size, right? Uh, they may not realize that there's a problem. Right? It's not until they end up using some code that eventually calls set size um, might they realize that there's a, uh, an issue with what they've done. Right? But the language itself doesn't bar you from uh, breaking inheritance uh, or uh, breaking the is a um, relationship. Okay, so here's a naive example of using inheritance. Right? Again, we're gonna go back and use the stack. Okay, so remember that stacks look a lot like lists, and we actually implemented a stack using a list, right? But, um, so we use composition with a list. Uh, now the question is, is did we have to use composition, right? Can we use inheritance, right? Because a stack kind of does look a lot like a list, right? I can add stuff to the end of the list. That's like pushing something onto the top of the stack, right? I can remove something from the end of the list, and that's exactly like popping an element off the, t off the top of the stack. So instead of using composition, why don't we just go ahead and inherit from list and see what happens. Right, so I'm gonna make a list of integers, right? Uh, I'm gonna call the class bad stack because it turns out this is not a good example, right? We're going to inherit from array list, right? And it's a list of integers, so I'm gonna inherit from array list integer, right? So when you want to use an inheritance relationship, you use the keyword extends, and then you specify the immediate superclass. So bad stack, its immediate superclass is array list. Right. Okay, so what does push look like for array list? Uh, sorry, what does push look like for bad stack? So remember when you write bad stack extends array list, you're saying a stack is an array list, right? What does that mean? All the fields that array list has, bad stack also has, right? All the methods that bad stack has Sorry, all of the methods that ArrayList has, bad stack also has, right? So I don't need any fields in the bad stack class, right? I'm gonna rely on ArrayList, uh, the fields that ArrayList has to do all of the work for it. So to push a value onto the stack, right? Remember, bad stack is a list, right? It is an ArrayList, which means it has an add method. So you can simply write this dot add the value or just add value, 
That also works in this case. Bad stack is a list, so it has a remove method. So I can simply write this dot remove this size minus one. Oh, it also has a size method, notice, right? Because all lists have a size method. Right? So I can simply remove the element from the end of the list, right? Uh, and shockingly, you're done, right? You now have a something that seems to behave like a stack. There's no constructor here, right? But again, remember that if you define no constructor, Java inserts one for you, right? So Java basically inserts a public bad stack constructor that does nothing, right? It actually does something. I don't know if I'll, be, I don't know if I'll reach the point where I can tell you what it does um, in this lecture, right? But it does in fact do something. Uh, this actually works. So you can write a little main method, make a stack, push some elements onto the stack. You can even print the stack because bad stack inherits two strings from array list. So you can print the stack and you can get out 0, 1, 2. Right. The uh, 2 is at the, the end element is the top element. Right. You can pop the stack. Right. When you pop them out, you get 2, 1, and 0. Down here, if, if you ask for the size of the stack, so 2 dot size, you'll get 0. Right. And everything seems to work exactly the way you want it to. Uh, there's a problem though, right? So this is uh, not a good idea, right? When you say that bad stack inherits from array list, right, you're saying that a stack is a list, right? So anything that a list can do, a stack can also do. So what does that mean? It means you can reach into the middle of the stack uh, and get the element from the middle of the stack, right? You just call get, right? Because get gets the element uh, at a specified index in a list. Now our stack is a list, so we can call get. That means you can also set the elements in the middle of the list, right? So you can set the element in the middle of the stack by calling set. You can remove any element from the stack that you want to because all lists have a remove method. You can even iterate over the elements of the stack, which admittedly might be useful, right? So that, great. These three, not so good if you want to make sure that this thing is really a stack. So for example, make a stack, push some numbers onto the stack, right? I'm only supposed to be able to look at the 300 in, a re in an actual stack, but I can go in and look at the number 200 here, right? So when you get number uh, element at index one, you get 200, right? I can set the element at index one to minus 1,000, right? So now I can reach into the middle of the stack and change a value. Um, these are not operations that you should, would normally uh, be uh, expected to be able to do if you have a pure stack. So this is an example of when you should not uh, use inheritance. You can argue this whether, you can argue that this might be fine to use inheritance as well, right? So sure, you can go into the middle of the stack and change the middle element, big deal, right? Um, uh, but th but uh, strictly speaking, this is an example of what you're not supposed to do with inheritance, right? You're only supposed to use inheritance when a true is a relationship actually exists. Conventionally, a stack is not a list, right? Therefore, you should not use inheritance to implement the stack. Right? Um, if all of this seems confusing to you, it's because it is, right? Even people who, have our, who are acknowledged experts um, or acknowledged programming experts get this wrong, right? If you go looking in the Java standard library, you will find javautil.stack. When you look at the, well, let's look at what sta how stack is defined. Uh, Java stack. There's the documentation for stack. Right. At the top of the documentation, we finally get to discover what the heck this means. This is showing you the inheritance hierarchy for stack. So this is telling you that stack uh, inherits from this class called vector. Right? Vector is the old array list in Java. Right? You can see that vector inherits from abstract list, which inherits from abstract collection, which inherits from object. Right? So this is saying that stack is a vector, which is a list. Right? So even the people who made the language made this mistake. Right? They implemented stack just by uh, recycling list, uh, by inheriting from list. Okay, so what is the correct solution in this particular case? 
right? Nowadays, most people will tell you, you shouldn't have used inheritance, you should have used composition, which is exactly what we did uh, two or three weeks ago, right? So instead of saying a stack is a list, use composition, and now stack has a list, right? Or I guess more precisely, stack has a collection of elements, right? Um, but that's the correct solution. Uh, that's what's generally considered to be the correct solution uh, nowadays. Right. So when you look online and you ask, uh, if you Google like disadvantages of inheritance, um, you'll often see the piece of advice is favor composition instead of inheritance. Right. Uh, and that's the generally accepted wisdom these days. Inheritance is still useful, however. Okay. So how can we actually use inheritance for proper code reuse? Uh, so for probably the simplest example that I've been able to come up with is to reuse this counter thing that we talked about earlier in the course. Right, so remember all counters start counting from zero. Right, you can ask the counter for its value. It counts upwards in increments of one. Right, when you, heat, when you hit max value, it wraps around to zero. Right, um, this might be great. Uh, for whoever created counter, right? But someone else can come along and say, hey, I don't want to wrap around at zero, right? I want to do something else, right? So if you want some other behavior when you hit max value, uh, well, you can just subclass counter uh, and change how advanced works. Right? So remember, here's counter, right? Internally, it has a private field called value, right? It's got a constructor, it's got a public method called value. So remember, in, if we use inheritance, we're going to inherit this method. We're not going to inherit this, num this value up here. So uh, what I mean by that is that we cannot see that field encounter in our subclasses. Right? Advance is public, so we inherit this method. Okay, so I would like to do something else when we hit max value. Um, now, the problem is, so I want to override advance, right? I want to make some new class that inherits from counter. I'm going to replace how advance works, right? The problem with replacing how advance works is I probably need access to value. And value is private, right? If I extend counter, I don't get direct access to this field in counter, right? It's private. Private means you can't see it outside the class, even in the subclasses. Oh, sorry, right? So our subclasses have no way to modify the value of the counter, right? And this turns out to be a very common problem when you try to extend a class that was never designed for inheritance in the first place, right? So our original version of counter, we had no idea what inheritance was, right? We didn't even know it existed. So we did the correct thing. We made our fields private so that no one could access the fields directly, right? But now we're in the situation where we would like to uh, subclass counter. So now we have to go do some surgery on the counter class. Right? So we have to go into the counter class and we now have to make the field value accessible to the subclasses. I don't want everybody to be able to access the field, right? but I would like subclasses to be able to access the field. Right? So that's what the protected keyword is for. Uh, protected as an access modifier for fields lets subclasses access the field defined in the superclass. So we're gonna go in to counter, change uh, the private access to protected access. That's fine, okay. Now, uh, when we do this, we also should go in and uh, change uh, advance, change what the contract for advance reads like. Right. So here, oops, sorry. What did advance used to look like? Here. So advance used to promise that the value would wrap around to zero. Right? If I want subclasses to change this behavior, I can't promise that it always wraps around to zero. Right? The subclasses might do something else. So you now have to change uh, your documentation a little bit. Right? So here we put in a note. Right? We say subclasses might override this behavior or some language that is equivalent. Okay, so why am I changing the contract for advance, right? Subclasses are supposed to be substitutable for their superclass, right? If you don't modify the contract, 
then there's no way for people to know that subclasses might uh, change the behavior in advance and still be substitutable, right? So for example, this line is not here, right? Anybody using a counter is allowed to expect that the counter will wrap around to zero when you hit the maximum value, right? If your subclasses change that behavior, someone who's relying on this contract here, right, ignoring the underlying part, right, is going to be surprised, perhaps unpleasantly. Okay, so now we can go ahead and extend counter to implement different behaviors when we hit max value. Right, so for example, I can make a counter that stops counting. Right, so it counts zero, one, two, three, four, five, and then when it hits max value, it stops counting. Right, if you advance it again, it's still the maximum value. Right, okay, so make a new class called stopping counter. It extends our counter class. Right. Does it need any fields? The answer is no, right? The counter has a field in it that represents the count. I don't need any extra fields in this particular case. So no fields, right? Do not duplicate the value field from counter. So the current value of the stopping counter is stored in a field that belongs to the superclass. There's no need, and in fact, it's almost certainly incorrect to duplicate that field. Right. If you want to, you can add new fields, right? the new fields are not visible to the superclass. So in Java, well, in, in most object-oriented programming languages, superclasses generally know nothing about their subclasses, right? Anybody can make a subclass, so there's no way for the creator of the superclass to know every possible subclass. Okay, constructor, right? So our stopping counter should have a constructor in it. Um, we would like to initialize the counter value to zero. Right, so what goes here? All right, so the purpose of the constructor is to initialize the field of the object, uh, sorry, to initialize the fields of an object, right? That's true for every constructor. So how does the constructor set the field of a, set the value of a field that belongs to the superclass? Well, in this particular case, the field is protected. So if we wanted to, we could reach in and change it ourselves, right? But the field belongs to the superclass, so the superclass must have a mechanism that initializes the state of value, right? The mechanism is a superclass constructor. Right. So, from a subclass constructor, you can call the immediate superclass constructor, right? How do you do it? So, remember when you constructor chaining, we would write this round brackets, chain to another constructor in the same class. If you want to call the superclass constructor, you use the keyword super instead. So here, super round brackets round brackets calls the counter no argument constructor. The counter no argument constructor sets this value to zero. Right. And so that uh, is how you uh, call a superclass constructor from within a subclass constructor. Right. Use the keyword super. I should probably stop there. Uh, so it turns out what I just showed you here is the result of many rules uh, regarding constructors of a subclass. So I think I'm gonna stop here. We'll talk about the rules in the next class. If you do assignment two over the weekend, assignment two walks you through these rules. Uh, so you can read about this uh, in the assignment if you like to. Right. Uh, but that's it for today. Um, I will see you on Monday.